puppies are really cute when they're plump, um, but actually a plump puppy is not a health, healthy puppy. We really want puppies to be relatively lean, not skinny, but relatively lean as they develop um, because we do know that um, a puppy who's plump is probably growing maximally and that's not, um, that's not the healthiest way to feed our puppies as they grow. We tend to, as humans and as owners, to focus a lot on protein because everyone thinks, well, dogs need a lot of protein to build muscles when they're growing. And that's very true. A lot of the foods that we feed are already oversupplying protein. And the actual percentage difference between a puppy and a, an adult maintenance is only a few percentages in the diet. It's kind of the Wild West out there as far as senior diets go because there is no standard. And what that means is that one company might determine that a senior diet should be low protein. Um, another company may determine, no, it should be moderate or even high protein, but high quality protein. They all have their, their various approaches. In the last 10 years though, I, and I think this is a very exciting time, the types of foods that are available to dogs and the quality of those products has basically skyrocketed. Do's and don'ts. Chocolate. Talk about chocolate. Yeah, so it's not so much that chocolate is toxic to dogs, but rather large amounts of chocolate. here, I want to take a minute to tell you about our sponsor, Fig and Tyler. I see and use a lot of treats in my line of work as a certified dog behavior consultant. And to be honest, a lot of them are pretty terrible for dogs. And they don't give me the results I'm looking for. And that's why I love using Fig and Tyler treats. They have an amazing discount program for pet professionals. The treats come in a variety of proteins, pet pro-sized bags that last, little morsel-sized treats that are awesome for training, and I love the sample treat bags they send me for my classes. All you need to do is hit the Pet Pros tab on figandtyler.com and hit Join Program. Put Love Dog in the Referral tab, that way they know I sent you. Look, we want to give dogs treats that embody quality, transparency, and effectiveness. Giving single-ingredient made, human-grade, USDA-inspected meat, the same we would find in the grocery store, that aligns with my values, and it helps give me the results that I'm looking for. Quality is literally built into this brand. It's peace of mind in a bag. No mystery ingredients, no additive, no fillers, nothing fake. They've got a wide variety of treats like chicken heart, duck liver, tilapia, goat cheese, beef. I can make custom bundles and try different proteins just to mix it up. Treat your dog to the best. Choose Fig and Tyler and watch Tails Wag with Delight. Industry professionals will love the Pet Pro perks. Go sign up today. And the pet parents out there, as listeners for the podcast, you also receive a discount. Head over to their website and use Love Dog at checkout. Again, Love Dog is one word. It's not case sensitive, so don't worry about that. The website's figandtyler.com. That's F I G A N D T Y L E R.com. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today and welcome to our second show. This is episode two of the Love Dog podcast. Today's show is about dog food and how to feed your dog. Over the past couple of years, as I've worked on developing lovedog.com, I've asked a lot of people, mostly first-time pet parents, what they want most from a website about dogs. And over and over, I heard the same thing, and it surprised me. Mark, they said, just tell me how to feed my dog. And like I said, this really surprised me, and then I realized it made a lot of sense. We're all confused because there are so many options out there. So how do we choose? At the same time, I'm sensing a very welcome revolution taking place in the pet nutrition arena. 
If you think about it, we've got now veterinarians aligning with large, well-known brands and new smaller niche brands to create dog food recipes. I'm sure a lot of you have seen those. There's also the continuous scientific research on the topic. And there are multiple types of food now available to us in the form of kibble, freeze-dried, air-dried, gently heat-cooked, raw. And as of January 2024, a new freeze-dried kibble. Each comes with their own set of claims to greatness, and we can't possibly know what is real and what is simply marketing hype. And even the packaging has become quite seductive and alluring. So when I say I was surprised by people's question, and then I realized it makes sense that we're all confused, this is exactly what I'm talking about. But at the end of the day, we do have to make a choice, and we do have to decide. Fortunately, there are specialists out there who know and understand the canine nutrition landscape and can help make that choice a little easier. And today, we are very fortunate to have Linda Case as a guest on the show. Not only is Linda an internationally acclaimed canine nutritionist, but she's also very easy to understand and an absolute pleasure to listen to. So I say, please listen in. I promise you're going to learn a lot from today's show. A couple of more things. As you can imagine, we are very excited about this new podcast. We already have great guests lined up, and we've already had a few great guests on the show. These are all experts and leaders in this field. As you know from listening to other podcasts, we all need your support to keep the momentum going. We need it to scale the show. We also need it to be picked up by the algorithms and to keep the great guests lining up to come on and to talk to us. We would be incredibly grateful if you'd follow on your podcast app or subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. As you know, it's all free. Leave a comment if you liked the show. Spread the word by telling your friends who you think might enjoy the show. And we also invite you and encourage you to follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Our handle is Love Dog News. And there's one more thing. This show is dedicated to a good friend of mine who recently crossed the Rainbow Bridge. His name was Gustavo. He was my neighbor's dog. He was a magnificent white Goldador, which is a mix between a Golden Retriever and a Labrador Retriever. And he was just a big part of my first year here in Boulder. I guess you could say that we grew attached to each other. He also became quick best friends with my lab, Hank, who I adopted just this past July. Gustavo was a therapy dog who worked here in schools and libraries and places, other places like that around Boulder, also bringing a lot of joy and a lot of comfort to the people, young and old, in this community. So this show is for you, Gustavo. It's made and produced in your name. Thanks for being such a great friend. A lot of us were touched and comforted by your beautiful spirit and soul. We already miss you a lot, and we wish you well on the next journey. So with that, let's jump into the interview with Linda Case. Drew, over to you. All right. Today on Love Dog, we welcome Linda Case. Linda Case is a canine nutritionist and science writer. She's a speaker and the owner of Autumn Gold Consulting and Dog Training Center in Mahomet, Illinois. She earned her Bachelor's of Science in Animal Science from Cornell University and her Master's in Canine and Feline Nutrition at the University of Illinois. Linda was a lecturer in Canine and Feline Science in the Animal Science Department at the University of Illinois for 15 years and then taught Companion Animal Behavior and Training at the College of Veterinary Medicine. She's authored numerous publications, including nine books and writes an amazing blog called The Science Dog, which is my go-to favorite resource for my clients and for myself when I need someone to help me make sense of this wild and wacky world of canine nutrition. In her latest book, Feeding Smart, Linda endeavors to dispel many myths surrounding canine nutrition. She also answers the most frequently posed questions by using research and data from leading studies on nutrition to provide a practical and evidence-based approach for feeding our dogs. First of all, Linda, welcome to the Love Dog Podcast. I'm so honored to have you here. Thank you, Drew, and and thank you, Mark, for inviting me. Thank you for coming. It's so important to us Mm -hmm. because we talk so much about how do we love our dogs, how we do the best for our dogs. And one of our missions is just to make it easier for people to do this through 
gaining knowledge and having these conversations. And so I'm so excited you're here to help us make sense of all these things and throw as many questions as we can at you, knowing that our goal isn't to pick the one food that's going to make everything perfect and easy so we can just hop online and buy it, but really to arm ourselves with the right questions and information so that we can go out there and make good choices and learn what we need to know. So we're going to hop right into it today, Linda, and just see where it takes us. Something I've gained from reading your books and I've also taken some of your wonderful classes on The Science Dog is thinking about the different stages of development for my dog. So not just purchasing food based on what I think is the best one, but really understanding what's right for my individual dog at that stage of life. Could you tell us a little bit more about why these stages are important when we're thinking about where a dog is in a developmental stage for selecting the food that might best serve them? Sure, sure. Um, probably the two biggest divisions are between growth, you know, when a puppy's growing up, and what we call adult maintenance. And so during growth, and there are a bunch of things going on, is that dog puppies grow really fast, especially when you compare them developmentally to humans, for example. If you think about a, a large breed dog, like maybe a, a greyhound or a Great Dane, for example, or really any large dog, they go from a couple pounds when you, from when you adopt them to sometimes over 100 pounds within a year and a half or so. So that period of growth is very fast. So they have to develop muscle, they have to develop their bones, they have to get energy and nutrients to do that. So for growing dogs, and, and really the period from when you get them, or from birth really, um, to about five or six months, they're growing very, very quickly. And then it starts to slow down a little bit depending on the breed size. So really the biggest nutrients to be concerned with during that time are providing our puppies with enough energy and a nutrient enough dense enough food that they have all their needs met. We tend to, as humans and as owners, to focus a lot on protein because everyone thinks dogs need a lot of protein to build muscles when they're growing. And that's very true, but a lot of the foods that we feed are already oversupplying protein. And the actual percentage difference between a puppy and a, an adult maintenance is only a few percentages in the diet. And so if you're feeding more quantity because the puppy has higher energy needs, you're very easily meeting those protein needs. So I would argue that once you meet energy and essential nutrient needs, your focus really should be primarily on quality and maintaining a normal body condition and a normal growth rate for that puppy during growth. Many of us grew up with the adage of, oh, puppies are really cute when they're plump, but actually a plump puppy is not a health, healthy puppy. We really want puppies to be relatively lean, not skinny, but relatively lean as they develop because we do know that a puppy who's plump is probably growing maximally and that's not, that's not the healthiest way to feed our puppies as they grow. We want them to basically grow optimally rather than maximally. And then when they reach adolescence, a couple things happen that people should be aware of. We often, not as often as we used to, because there's a lot of controversy over when the best time to spay and neuter is, but people still often neuter or spay their dog when they're reaching adulthood. And so oftentimes neutering gets blamed for great weight gain or over overweight conditions in these dogs, but oftentimes it's simply because the dog has reached adulthood and needs less energy and is less active. Certainly there are some metabolic changes with spaying and neutering that appear to contribute to differences in um, interest in food and appear to, and may also even affect metabolic rate. But overall, when our dogs reach adulthood, they're going to have reduced um, energy needs because they're not growing as fast they're, and they eventually slow down growing altogether. And many dogs also will reduce their activity level. Not all. <laughs> if you have a lab or a golden or a doodle, wait till they're about eight or nine for that to happen. But in general, when dogs reach adulthood, they're going to slow down their energy needs, their activity levels. So they need less energy. I think Mark just had an epiphany on how long he's going to have to wait for his dog to reach that level. No, <laughs> you are not a mind reader. Actually, as she said, goldens in labs, I've raised two goldens and I'm now racing a lab. So I actually watched <laughs> the two goldens get a little heavy. Uh -huh. 
and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later, sure, what I did sure. to get the weight off the second one. But the interesting thing about that is you don't really even notice it because you're looking at the dog every day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you see a picture you're like, oh my God. Look how, look how <laughs> is that my is. dog? <laughs> <laughs> what have I done to this poor dog? <laughs> that outside objective so, relative um, that comes over. Huh? <laughs> What was that, Drew? You need that outside objective relative who comes over and says, Mark, what's yeah. going on here? Yeah, right. yeah. Mark, your dog is morbidly obese. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Linda, something you mentioned there, you, you talked about a couple different breeds that while you're saying them just appeared in my mind, the difference of what somebody who's familiar with, say, a sight hound, like a greyhound and body condition would look like compared to those kind of um, more cylinder looking dogs, like when you're looking down and, and something I've heard you say before is we sort of have culturally normalized what a healthy dog looks like. And I heard you kind of reference it there. Um, yeah. when, what is the value and, and really people need to be knowing not only their breed and their breed package, but what they look like at different stages of development to know if they're getting, those nutritional gains and, and if they need to increase that feeding or change that feeding? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, what always comes to mind, and, and you probably have this in, in your training practice as well, Drew, is that in our school, what we've always done is we have a little section at, with our basic class and saying, teaching people how to evaluate and assess their dog's body condition. And one of the things that we talk about is, okay, consider what a, a greyhound looks like or any type of gaze hound breed, you know, long legs, deep chest, very slender body um, versus a basset hound, you know, short little legs, stocky body. So we intuitively know that the body condition of those two very dramatically different breeds is going to be different. So you don't expect a, a basset hound to look like a, a greyhound and vice versa. So, so knowing your dog's breed or breed type, because we have so many mixed breeds, just their type in general, and having an understanding of what a normal um, healthy body condition for that breed type is very helpful. And then there are these skills such as palpating a dog's ribs, palpating the fat above the back of their tail where their tail meets their body, um, looking at their abdomen and making sure they don't have a pendulous abdomen. Those are all great tools too, but just visually having this idea of what a healthy doodle looks like, what a healthy gay sound looks like, what a healthy golden retriever looks like and should look like, I think is really helpful to people. Regardless of breed, basset hound, golden, you know, in size, is there a point where the dog is just no longer a puppy and now they are officially an adult? Officially. <laughs> like if they got their yeah. driver's license. I guess license. they're like a bar mitzvah and like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like that. Um, the bar, well, I think bar okay, they're you know, <laughs> you're, you're six months old, you're eight months old, you're now you're, you, move you've made it. Yeah. Adult Food. Yeah, is, is, there are a couple of things. First, it, it's a great question because small breeds mature more quickly. So, you know, our, our larger breeds, um, even though, as I mentioned earlier, they're growing very rapidly, they still do mature uh, physically later than small breeds. So that's the first thing, you know, most tiny breeds or, mid or medium breeds will be mature in about a year. And we figure about a year and a half to even two years for our, our large and giant breeds. The other thing to consider, and this is segueing a little bit into, into Drew's area of behavior, is um, what we refer, refer to as social maturity and then behavioral maturity. And those don't necessarily coincide with physical maturity. We talk a lot about in, in our school about working breeds that may develop some protective instincts over their home or territorial behaviors. A lot of times territorial behaviors don't show up until a dog's a year and a half or two years old, but they may be physically mature prior to that. So that's the other thing to consider is that emotions and behaviorally, a dog um, may mature usually later <laughs> um, than physically. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. and again, if, since you have a lab, you're probably well aware of that. And uh, I would say mm -hmm. it's probably true for Goldens too. So even though they act like a little child, essentially, at a certain point, eight months, nine months, I'm putting that dog onto an adult formula. 
Oh, for de- nutrition. Yeah. What, the, the, the division between puppy foods and adult foods for medium breeds and small breeds is pretty minor. In fact, we generally don't even make that distinction anymore all the time. The, the major premise with a puppy and an adult food where it becomes really important is with the large and giant breeds. And that's primarily because of calcium and the levels of calcium in those foods, but even actually more importantly, the energy density. And what we know is that rate of growth influences skeletal health and that in large and giant breeds, if we can keep that rate of growth moderate, we can support optimal skeletal growth and hopefully prevent some of those skeletal diseases that they get. So for large and giant breeds, even though this seems counterintuitive, the puppy foods for those breeds are actually less energy dense than they are for smaller breeds. And it, again, that seems counterintuitive because we know that large breeds need more energy and more food. But the reason is that if you really give, say, a high fat diet that's very energy dense to a growing large breed dog, they're going to grow really fast and that's not necessarily healthy for them. Um, so, it's so, like so I guess- you relate that to the plant world, it's like, don't give them miracle grow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Very, in a way, I mean, yes. that's, that's yeah. what it makes me think about. It's a great point. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. Don't, don't so, do it. So, right. Yeah, practically speaking, when you asked about when do you switch from puppy to a, adult food, interestingly, as I said earlier, it's really before five months that really fast rate of growth occurs and that the one that can predispose to skeletal problems, even though the marketing will tell you a year and a half or two years before you switch, a year is fine for most dogs. The big thing is to be careful about their weight and their rate of growth. Okay. That's good. That's good. It's really helpful. And I think I've heard you say before, Linda, that maximum growth does not actually equal optimal growth and that we really have to understand what's right for that individual dog. And something I've been privy to have the conversation with you before is, my Chinook hanging around here is turning 12 this year, and he's a larger guy, like 86 pounds. And I find it even blurrier that next phase of like, when is he a senior? When do I need to think about if his diet needs to change? Like, boom, one day wakes up if he has a senior moment. And I say, okay, now it's time. Do I need to do anything different for an older dog? And I think that's something I heard you saying was you don't need to go crazy with protein and make all these big changes, especially if he's doing well, right? Excellent. Yes, very good point. And the other thing I would add to that is that while the AFCO nutrient profiles are, are basically what, what most pet food companies in the U.S. anyway, they formulate their formulas to meet, their foods to meet, they're only two categories for that. And those two categories are growth and reproduction, which is for puppy foods and adult maintenance. And so it's the wild west out there as far as senior diets go, because there is no standard. And what that means is that one company might determine that a senior diet should be low protein. Another company may determine, no, it should be moderate or even high protein, but high quality protein. They all have their various approaches. Some may include higher fiber for GI health. There's all kinds of senior diets out there. Some may be less energy dense because of weight gain in senior dogs. So the idea of quote unquote switching a dog who's been determined to be a senior to a senior diet is pretty meaningless because they, there, there are so many different formulations and different approaches to what even a senior diet is. So as you said, if you've got a healthy senior and the food you're feeding is keeping that animal healthy, I would, there's no reason to change. The only time you might consider it is if you're, you've got some osteoarthritis. My feeling on that is first go to the vet and see if there's any medical approach that would be really helpful. There's some amazing new drugs right now available for osteoarthritis. Secondarily look at diet because their diet can supplement medical interventions. But I would argue that diet is not the first place to go for arthritis problems. And the other, of course, is kidneys. If a dog does start to develop kidney failure, then you should talk to your veterinarian about the protein level and the quality of that protein in the diet, but not until there's actually a problem. So when you use the term energy, is there a relation there to calories If the dog is heavy and the dog is senior, we want to reduce the caloric intake to some extent? Yes, thank you for, yeah, that's what I'm referring to is the caloric intake. Yeah. 
Okay. So just like with people. Yes. Can, at a certain point, yes, you can start like- to consider cl- calories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even, you know, as I said, ener- when I say energy density, that means calorie mm-hmm. density, caloric density. Mm-hmm. And, and um, one of the things that I talk about in way back in Dog Food Logic is the huge range in caloric density or energy density amongst the foods that people can select from. And that can really get people into a pickle because they may think this looks like a little bit of a better food for my dog and not realize that it's 50 kcals per cup more energy dense than the food they were feeding. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they've got little plump Fido on their hands. I Mm -hmm. just inadvertently not realize that difference is making a huge difference in Mm -hmm. in the caloric intake of that dog. Mm -hmm. Is there Weight Watchers for dogs? (laughs) There's certainly (laughs) plenty of weight control (laughs) diets out there. (laughs) Could be a new business, right? (laughs) Yeah. I think it's actually a big business already. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. Drew and I were actually speaking before, just before you came on and he asked me, so what do we, what's our mission here today? It was a good question. I said, Hey Drew, I just want to teach people how to feed their dogs. (laughs) And he laughed, but, and it is funny, but as I've said to Drew, I've been asked by a lot of people over the last couple of years, Mark, just tell me how to feed my dog. It's overwhelming, I think, for consumers, for dog owners and guardians. There are so many choices in terms of brands, and I see them myself when I go to the pet supply shows. It's unbelievable. The marketing hype, which I know we'll talk about, and the packaging, which is so beautiful and well done. It's all very seductive, right? And then, of course, there are actually the diets, just like we have our diets, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, whatever your thing is. There are the kibble diets. There are the the raw diets, the freeze-dried diets, the gently heated fresh food kinds of things. Now we're hearing about air-dried food. Even plant-based, I think, is now coming in because it's a very popular diet for humans. And people just don't know what to do. So is it a question of mixing things up? I also think this is a good point for me to say, at least in terms of my feeding my own dog, and I imagine I'm not alone in this, I eat a certain way for myself, and that's a personal choice. It's a lifestyle choice. It's also a value, I think. It's a value system that I have for myself. So can we speak to the different types of diets, the kibble to the freeze-dried to the raw, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, just speak to that a little bit and help us out and help our listeners try to make some sense of all this. Sure. And there's the question of affordability as well. So. Right. Right. And that, yeah. Yeah. I talk about that a lot in um, dog food logic um, because, you know, that is an important prong of that question is that is values is if someone's selecting a food because it's, GMO free, or if they are selecting a food because they want the ingredients sourced domestically, or because they're vegan, or those are all value selections. And certainly price point comes into that as well. And I find that in today's markets, because of the choices that are available, price point does become pretty important. So when I wrote Dog Food Logic, which is already almost 10 years old, it's hard to imagine that. A lot of the a lot of the advice that I provided in that book centered around how to differentiate among dry kibbles, which are called extruded dry foods. Because at that time, I would say still more than 90% of American owners were feeding dry food as their primary diet. In the last 10 years, though, I and I think this is a very exciting time, the types of diet of foods that are available to dogs and the quality of those products has basically skyrocketed. And so I would change. In fact, I was we're considering doing a, a second edition of that book. And one of the changes I will make is to include these many different categories of food and how they differ from one another. So first and foremost, I guess what I would advise is if someone's staying within that 
one market of dry kibble, which are extruded. And when I say extruded, I mean a food that is um, includes mainly dry ingredients like dry protein meals that are rendered and that rendering, um, to just make it a uh, long story short, rendering comes from um, feed grade or pet grade ingredients, which are basically byproducts that are then um, cooked at a very high heat and sterilized. So that's, those are rendered dry meals and, and almost all, not almost all, all extruded foods really use some type of, if they have an animal protein of, of some type of animal rendered meal. So all of those foods are pretty similar in that and that they're cooked in the same way and they contain very similar ingredients. So there's not a lot of, of difference among them other than perhaps the percentages of different ingredients that are in them, how much animal protein they may have versus plant-based protein, and to some degree, the quality of those ingredients. So many of you have probably, this is very old advice, but it still stands if someone is selecting within the dry pet food market, within an extruded food. And the first is to avoid byproduct meals. Now, they're actually all byproduct meals, but because of AFCO definition rules, it's a very strange system. Only some byproduct meals are called byproduct meals and others are just called meals. So in general, like a poultry byproduct meal is of lower quality than a poultry meal. And so the first thing is avoid byproduct animal protein meals. The second is search out foods that have a named animal meal. That would be poultry meal versus chicken meal. And in general, chicken meal is higher quality than poultry meal. These are all generalities that are backed up by research, but there's also overlap amongst these different meals. So I think the point is none of them are great. They're all okay, and some are a little better okay than others because they're all coming from the byproduct industry of human foods. They're all rendered and they're all very highly ultra processed. And the third issue is when you're looking at a label to make sure there's some animal protein meal within the first three to five ingredients. So then you've got an animal protein based food. Those things are all still very true. And I do even talk about them in Dog Food Logic. But the thing that's changed is that just as we started learning about our own diets, and I think Mark in our discussions well, before we start, we kind of alluded to this, that we know that ultra pro processing um, is not the best way to eat. We all know, you know, making a meal out of just McDonald's is probably not good or just frozen um, meals, frozen dinners is not healthful. We know now through research that um, the same is probably true for dogs, is that ultra processing is not just associated with nutrient loss, but it's associated with changes to those diets um, that may produce end products that might not be healthful. So what that's led to, and also I, I think just the change in what dogs mean to us and how we live with them, there's an expansion of the types of foods that are available from no processing at all, such as in raw foods, to minimal processing, such as in fresh cooked foods and freeze dried and dehydrated foods. And also what has entered the market are human grade foods that are basically produced from the same ingredients we make our own foods from and that are different, are, are very different in terms of their quality from pet grade ingredients. So I would Can argue just, that if, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. That's okay. I just want to get on. I just, we were talking about the kibble for the most part initially, and I still think most people feed their dogs at least some kibble. I, I have a sense that's true. If for no other reason, price, but even kibble isn't, and it, kibble's become quite yeah. expensive. You know, I can't believe how expensive it's become. So now you go into these stores and there are like these gourmet brands of kibble and you're getting things like, and I'm looking at them and buying them, to be honest, you know, wild caught white fish, you know, wild caught salmon. I'm getting grass fed beef, grass fed lamb. I'm getting non-GMO vegetables, which to me says, okay, no Roundup, no glyphosate, if that's what they are getting out there. And I think it is. And I like that. Is there a benefit once it's all baked at a very high heat or is it just marketing? 
I think that's something I, without naming brands, there's no need to, it's just, these are products that, are, and I have looked at the ingredients, by the way, on the label, and there is the first few ingredients are the human grade or just the grass fed beef or the wild caught fish. Then there is some meal in there as well. Should I be paying the premium is the question. So there are a couple, two issues here, really. One is, um, labeling and what's allowed marketing wise on the label, because that can be very misleading. And the second that you bring up is the destruction or, or what happens to a food because of the high heat and pressure processing that's involved with extrusion. To the first end, I should mention that if you're feeding a dry food, there are no human grade ingredients in that food. So when you see wild caught salmon first on that on that late on that ingredient list that salmon is still the discards from human food industry it's usually it comes basically frozen it's basically anything that's either not been used in the human industry for whatever reason or it's what's left over of a carcass after we've taken the best bits for ourselves and that's frozen in these huge packs and the reason it's listed first on a dry pet food label is because it's added into the slurry in wet form and most meats are about 60 percent water so since just like in human foods, labeling requirements are that the food, the ingredient that is of the highest weight is listed first. But when that's cooked off, the actual salmon that would provide is very small. So it's very misleading. That's when they said fresh chicken first. It's a very misleading labeling trick, if you will. But I wouldn't just because it says wide cut, wild caught salmon, it doesn't mean that's the same salmon you would get at a restaurant or in the supermarket. It may be wild caught, but it's still going to be at the, it's still going to be a byproduct of the human food industry. And my um, my interpretation of of that, I'm loving this discussion. By the way, you know my inter. I hope you are. <laughs> my, my, my interpretation of wild caught, why that's important to me. It's just because it would mean versus farm raised. Yes. And so when I hear farm raised salmon, for example, in the human food market, I hear antibiotic being put into the pen where the fish are. And then that antibiotic makes it into the fish and then in, into us as we eat it. So the hope would be if they're using wild caught fish in the kibble, that the antibiotic has not been added, even if it's just the you know the remains of the fish carcass. Right. right? Yeah. No, I, I would. In, I would in definitely that carcass, agree. there isn't the antibiotic. Right. That's my yeah, hope. Yeah. That's my hope. Uh, and 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 I think that's a very valid hope. I, and, and, and probably true. Um, what I would also add to that, and, and there's some research on this, um, it's not something I've looked at recently, but but I know that some farm raised salmon, because you know people eat a lot of cold water fishes because they want the omega-3 fatty acids, right? But if we fish are only what they eat, just like we are. And so if you're feeding farm raised salmon grains from our agricultural industry that are very high in omega-6 fatty acids, you end up with salmon that are not a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. So personally, that would be also another reason I would say that wild caught sounds better than, or should be better nutritionally than farm raised. So yes, you're very, that's valid. What I wouldn't, what I wouldn't expect though, is for that salmon to be as high a quality in terms of the being muscle meat, which is more digestible, basically a higher quality protein than what, than what it's not human grade. It would still be a byproduct. And this kind of gets back to that tug of war, Linda, of getting, quote unquote, duped by marketing. And what Mark's talking about is really shopping for his dog with his sense of values, with his yes. intentions, with his hopes. And I remember in Dog Food Logic, you outlined four primary factors for people to consider when feeding their dog. And you broke those down. Do you want to talk about those or do you want me to remember <laughs> <you>? them all? <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah. I just um, said so it's 10 years old. And I... <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. In doing my research, I pulled them back. So sure, we can that'd go be great. The, 
Um, but you talked about the individual dog, which is kind of like we were talking about. So the life stage and activity levels, and that's what we kind of covered earlier. And then second was the guardian themselves. So what are the things that influence my decisions when I'm standing there in front of the, you know, this huge wall of foods and the refrigerators over here and the free dries over here and the kibbles here, the dry extruded kibbles in front of me. And a lot of that also comes down to not only what my values are, but like what works for us. So we have economic factors. I have two small children. So, you know, you're not going to find me cooking for my dog after the long, busy day. I'm going to always have my base formula that I use. And then I'm going to find those times when maybe my resources are more available or my intentions are, okay, can I increase this nutrient? I heard it's good for aging dogs and what kind of evidence do I have? Usually it comes from the science dog blog. I don't know if you've heard of that. What informs me to try to do better, but it might be something more, oh, his stool's been a little off lately. Is there something I can do to aid in digestion and things like that? And then you also talk about the food itself. So you were just talking about ingredients, but knowing what are those ingredients? Where do they come from? What are some of the sourcing? And is that something we can see right on the bag or going down to the fourth tier, is that something we need to contact the manufacturer to learn those things? And I think something I've always gotten from you was getting away from the front of those bags, those labels, those marketing things and flipping it over and being brave enough to read those ingredients and going, oh, I do remember that byproduct is an ideal meal is okay. This would be better. And and understanding what am I looking at when I turn that bag around? Yeah, yeah. And the front of of the bag is, as Mark said earlier, is very seductive. And it's always boggled my mind that you can see an entire roast chicken that your grandmother used to serve at Thanksgiving on the front of a bag. But if you look at what chicken meal actually looks like, it looks like dried (laughs) cornmeal. And you're not, but they're allowed to do that, you know. Should we talk about just quickly in this section, raw food? Should we talk about plant-based diets? Should we talk about the gently heated type foods, air-dried foods, freeze-dried foods? Just so I'd love to hear what you have to say about all these things. Sure, sure. Um, and, and to kind of just segue back a little bit to, to Drew's point, and we, again, Drew, I know in your work, you probably do this. We always think of it both in terms of nutrition and definitely in terms of behavior and training is meeting our clients where they are. And if someone, and the reason I bring that up now is that, Mark, as you said, dry kibble is, even though some dry kibbles have gotten quite expensive, it's still in general, the most economical to feed and the most convenient. So, you know, busy households, you know, um, are not going to be spending, you know, the time or, and sometimes not the money um, to, to select these more expensive and more time consuming foods. But I would add to that is that it's not an all or nothing thing is that um, what we have come to over the years um, both from research and from practical experience, is um, is mixing and matching food, and and that the old adage of just one food and that's all you feed is is pretty much gone by the wayside. Certainly, all nutritionists don't follow that adage anymore, and and happily, most veterinarians no longer are either because they took a little while to come over to, <laughs> from to join us in that. But someone simply buying a fresh cooked food that has human grade and adding a little bit of that each day to the kibble to a high quality kibble can greatly improve that dog's quality of food that they're consuming. So it doesn't have to be, oh my goodness, I have to remortgage my house in order to buy this food or <laughs> quit my job so I can cook every night for the dog. It, there are gradations within that can meet people where they happen to be. So in terms of foods, one of the ways to, I would say two major ways of categorizing are the degree of processing, you know, from no, virtually no processing at all, which you'd put a raw diet in or minimally processed. And then minimally or moderately processed would be like a fresh cooked food or dehydrated food or freeze dried food. And then ultra processed, we would do our kind of our standard traditional extruded dry kibble and canned foods. Um, And so across those processing ranges, what the research is showing us is that 
not only do we lose nutrients, um, essential nutrients, when we ultra process a food, but that it destroys the protein. And we know more and more about that in terms of the protein damage that occurs. And that can really influence how bioavailable, I know Mark was waiting for me to use the word bioavailable <laughs> today, <laughs> um, how bio, bioavailable. Um, My that, life that is all about bioavailability. I know, yes. I know. <laughs> you do. So, <laughs> so I will define bioavailability because this was a discussion prior to starting that, that Mark was very interested in. <laughs> but it's um, not but, a hot topic, okay? Yeah, okay. It's not a hot topic, but it is a topic. A topic. Um, <laughs> so bioavailability is just kind of one step up from digestibility. You know, digestibility tells you how much of something that an animal eats actually makes it into their body. They absorb from their intestine. Bioavailability is even more intricate, and that means once it's in, once it's in the body, how it's utilized or how it interacts with other nutrients or how maybe if it was damaged by processing, it behaves differently in the body or isn't as available in the body or isn't metabolized in the same way. So in many ways, bioavailability is more important than digestibility because it really tells us how a nutrient is actually used by the body. Um, well, so, there so you we, go. So there you bio. go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We've got it in here. <laughs> Bioavailability. Yes. Right. It's, it's a new Drew, show. Drew, we're going to do a show on bioavailability. All right. Okay. Yes. Coming soon. Yes. <laughs> Coming People will be on the edge of their seats. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. with that respect, so that's one way of classifying. And in general, and they get, there's some really good research on this, like freeze dried foods do quite well because they don't have the damage to the protein that you see with the high heat processing. Raw foods also generally are highly digestible. Some of the issues with those, of course, are food safety because of food pathogens that might be available be present and also to some degree formulation because since they're raw they can have no carb source in them so they tend to be very high in protein and high in fat and that can be a bit of an issue but in general in terms of nutrient digestibility and bioavailability they'd be very good the other category i would say and it's separately is the pet grade versus human grade ingredients and again human grade being much higher on the quality scale than pet grade. Within pet grade ingredients, there is definitely some, I would argue it's not very much, but there is enough to make a difference between certain some products, certainly the lower end versus the higher end dry products. Um, but that's a very strong distinction is between foods that are produced using pet grade ingredients and foods that are produced using human grade ingredients. When you look at those two categories, the price point is hugely different. Human grade ingredients are expensive. So that's why I would caution people that don't feel like you have to sell the farm to feed your dog. You can just, just use a small amount. And then the last thing I want to mention, because Mark mentioned it earlier, was the idea of sustainability. There, there's no way anyone can argue that feeding a high meat diet to dogs is sustainable. And for this reason, many researchers and nutritionists are looking at plant-based protein sources, some really new, interesting ones, and also insect-based The whole insect sources. thing, right. That's a you hot know. topic. Right? Yeah, there you go. We get that our hot topic hot, in. That is a hot topic now. <laughs> that right, is a exactly. hot topic. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Hey, Drew here. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Fig and Tyler. Remember, these are those amazing dog treats that I use exclusively. They've got an awesome program for pet professionals. All you have to do is go to their website, figandtyler.com, click the Pet Pros tab and hit Join Program. Put Love Dog in the Referral tab. If you're a pet guardian and you want to get your hands on these premium treats that the pros use, just put Love Dog in the promo code at checkout. You're going to get 10% off your order. That's figandtyler.com. F-I-G-A-N-D-T-Y-L-E-R.com. There's a very simple question I have, and that is, does the dog actually enjoy some variety? So for example, the best way to add, I just initially bought him a fish food, and then I went to lamb, then I went to beef, and I decided, well, that's going to be my rotation. In the morning, he gets some soft-boiled egg and apple in his food. In the evening, some broccoli, cauliflower, and carrots. And I might even leave out the apples and egg one morning and do some oatmeal with some blueberries in it. Is he enjoying the variety, or is that just in my head? Again, going back we to know. the overall 
I, no, I would say he enjoys it. I, I would say the onus is on people to prove to us that they don't enjoy it, then rather than our, right. our having to prove they enjoy it. It's the same with animal sentience that we should, you know, people are like, well, are animals sentient? Are they are they emotional? No, the onus should be on you proving to me that they're not, because we're all mammals, right. we're all evolutionary, you know, related. So there'd be no reason to think they don't enjoy their food, because again, you could even make an evolutionary argument for it of, you know, enjoying something that you have to do a lot, you know. So, so of course, I would argue at least anecdotally that yes of course dogs enjoy a variety there is some evidence in cats i think less so in dogs that cats who are raised on a single flavor and type of food tend to develop what are called fixed food preferences and that then it's very difficult to get them to eat other foods but that's less obvious with dogs you know i don't think we see fixed food preferences as frequently in our dogs as we do in cats so at least anecdotally i would say yeah um my, my dogs if they were out in the wild <laughs> Well, they're omnivores. So they're, they're uh, exactly. Fruit, and they scavenge. They're eating vegetable. They're yes. eating meat, right? Yep. And, so, and you can argue know. that, yeah. You want to eat the same thing every day is where I'm coming from? No. Yeah. That's where I'm coming from with this. Right, right. If that's well, if you okay. think of it from any species on this planet, even if you consider captive animal populations, there's no species we would recommend to feed the same diet for, through the course of their life. It just nope. doesn't right. make any sense. Right. When exactly. you have something that's that intuitive, we have to listen to that intuition and say, I agree. why should it be different from dogs? And it's that coming back to, we were marketed you feed this and this is dog food and it stays the course because there was a lot of money to be made there. And so as we <laughs> yes. start talking about what are the things we need to have in there, we've talked about these different categories from dry extruded that we all know as kibble and these less processed foods that we're now seeing these semi-fresh foods and these dehydrated foods. What are some of the things, no matter which type you're picking, Linda, that you would consider to be essential? How would you be looking at those to say, this is gonna meet those needs as far as knowing that we need to consider our breed, our, our stage of life and things like that, but are there certain categories and check boxes that people could go and look at those and say, yeah, that, that fits the bill. That's what I'm looking for. Sure, and I think even though the whole complete and balanced claim was it's originally actually is a marketing claim and didn't even have any science behind it, and now does have good science behind it. So when you see that claim on a food, it does mean that food contains all the nutrient, all the essential nutrients that a dog needs for that stage of life, balanced to energy, balanced to calories for that dog. But it doesn't follow that you should only feed a single food then. So I think the complete and balanced claim is helpful rather than because you don't want to feed a food that's imbalanced and, and miss out on some essential nutrients. But that doesn't mean that they should select just a single food. So I would say, yeah, definitely select a food that's complete and balanced. Feed, feed My own recommendations are to feed a variety of foods among types as well, if you can. Again, sometimes price point is important there, sometimes time constraints. But if people can select several foods that they that they trust and that they know have been are formulated for their dog's life stage then to use either mix them or rotate them is is i i think probably the health healthiest way to feed and now we get to move on to fat dogs obesity <laughs> <laughs> why not just say it right it's a problem we see them every day i can tell you that my golden had, be as I said earlier, had become heavy. I don't think I noticed it because I look at him every day and I wasn't really seeing it. But when I look at pictures, I'm just like, oh my God, this dog was very heavy. And one of the things that I did, and it wasn't that, any, it wasn't that anyone told me to do it. I just did it because I think he was also having some issues with acid reflux. So I thought I better try something completely different. And I started roasting a chicken breast for him, a boneless chicken breast and steaming cauliflower, broccoli and carrots and throwing a little turmeric in there. And I would do that three or four nights a week over the course of, I'd say, and it, the goal at that point wasn't so much the weight loss as it was to try to help his digestion and his stomach out. He also, it turns out, lost quite a bit of weight and he okay. came down to yeah. a normal weight. Do you have any advice for what to do with a dog who's still healthy, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, but they're getting very heavy. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, um, your your example is a good one because even though it seems counterintuitive, um, dry foods can contribute to obesity, but in a very strange way because they're really dry. They are tend to basically on a dry basis. They're quite energy dense, um, and so you know what looks like. Uh, not a very big volume of food actually is, is very energy packed. So if you compare that calorie, to say, calorie packed, calorie packed. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Energy <laughs> equals calorie. Just energy it's a good, equals it's calorie. a good thing. Yeah. To think yes. about that. Yeah. 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 Calories are energy. Right. Um, so calorie packed. Um, it, it seems counterintuitive because it's just like, it looks like cereal to us, you know, but when we look at say, just for comparison, a fresh cooked food that is about 60%, sometimes even 70% water, which is probably what is comparable to what you were feeding to your dog, that's actually going to be a less calorically dense by volume. And so we tend to feed by volume is we tend to look at, I give a cup of food, right? But if you're giving a cup of a food that's 60% water versus a cup that's only 10% water, you're actually mm-hmm. giving many more calories. So we tend to cause that, not that there's anything inherently wrong with the dry food. It's just that it is on a dry matter base, it's quite energy dense, calorie dense. And so that Mm -hmm. I think does tend to contribute to our tendency to overfeed our dogs and to, for them to gain weight. Just what you did, again, you did it inadvertently, gave him a higher quality food for sure, but it's probably just that you were feeding him less, less calories and Mm -hmm. that was good for him as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So certainly reducing calories, you know, we always hear increased dogs um, activity level and from a behavior and training aspect point that, can never be a bad mm-hmm. thing. You know, our dogs mm-hmm. can always benefit from playing games with us, from going for walks, for playing, mm-hmm. for going swimming. All those are really good things. Um, but generally, you know, um, reducing the amount of food, the calories that go in um, is the best, mm-hmm. best approach. Do you have any stats on how, what percentage of dogs are overweight? In, or- it's high. Yeah, there's there's a, a group called APOP, the Association of Pet Over pet over overweight pets or something like that. Um, oh, really? I think they're, yeah. Um, uh, Ernie wow. Ward, Dr. Ernie Ward is the founder and the CEO of it. It's a nonprofit. It's, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's APOP, I think. Um, but their last estimate that I saw, and he does a lot of surveys of um, veterinary clinicians. The last one that I saw said something like 66% overweight or obese. Oh my God. Which is huge. Yeah. You know, and that's Do including you think, overweight. Linda, that we've sort of normalized obesity in dogs? And I know that sounds weird to say, but I, I kind of remember some research being done with... Um, your average pet owners doing those body condition scales yeah, yeah. alongside veterinarians. Can you help me yeah, on that? It's- yeah, yeah. Because I think I talked about it in, in either Dog Food Logic or I might talk about it in um, in Feeding Smart. Yeah, it's fascinating research because not only so you know everyone knows those those um, <laughs> everyone knows the the uh, the charts. The, you know, here's a fat dog and here's a skinny dog and the perfect dogs in the middle that all veterinarians have in their offices. And these are great charts. Um, Many pet food companies have developed them. Veterinarians use them. Um, They give great tips on how to determine if your dog's at their correct body condition. So what they did was they asked veterinarians to score dogs and owners to score dogs. And probably not unexpectedly, the owners would score their dog at a normal weight when they weren't, when they were overweight, whereas the veterinarians tended to be right spot on. But owners tended to see their dogs as being a normal weight when they were overweight. What's more fascinating about that research is then they took those same owners and gave them training in using the in using the charts, thinking they'll change their scores. And not only did they not change their scores, but the ones that did change them changed them in the wrong direction. <laughs> and so it, you know, it's almost that whole thing of you know people just it's your confirmation digging, bias. Work, confirmation right? bias, exactly. Digging their heels. I'm doubling in. down. He looks exactly, great. Exactly, exactly. Doubling down. Nope, he's not fat. Um, so, so, so it's a little disheartening, I think, for the pet food companies who've put so much work into those charts and the veterinarians. Um, but it, but it go, it does speak to what Drew just mentioned, this whole normalizing of what what is basically normalizing an overweight condition and thinking that's a normal weight dog, you know, and, and that's a hard thing to, uh, to combat for sure. Well, I think it's also possible 
you're looking at your dog every day and you don't really notice it. But if you take a look at a picture, a photograph of that you've taken of the dog, I think that's where you might really begin to see it. I was shocked and, and sad, I might say, that I let the dog get right. that overweight. I, I really tried not to do that, but it's, especially, you know, if you live in a place where you have a change of seasons and a lot of, most of us do actually, and in the winter time, you're spending more time indoors and you might not be taking that mile long walk in the park that you do every day, you know, th- you know, for, mo- for a lot of the year, the dog might just like, like we do, we just, get, we're, do- we're moving around less, we gain some weight. And if we, if we, as the ones feeding the dog, don't adjust the diet, right, then, and they're eating the same diet as they were if they're running every day, they're going to gain weight, just like we right. would gain weight. So plus, I guess, as they get older, their metabolism probably slows down a bit too. Right. So, right. Yeah, it yeah. definitely does. Yeah. 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 And that's so, why one of the, one of the advice for, for that is, is for owners to, ha- when they go to take their dog to the veterinarian and ask the veterinarian to compare the weight to when the dog was a young adult and right. use that or use right. pictures like you did. Oh, this is what he looked at like when he was two. And yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. And well, I think if you have a breed you said like that, that about seasons, sorry, Mark, sorry? I was just going to add to you when you said about seasons, I go and I train dogs throughout the day and I will sometimes see it. And I never want to, essentially fat shame the dog, but I'll say, Hey, what's going on? I've noticed (laughs) your dog's gained a lot of weight and it tends to correlate with changes in things that are happening in the home and seasons, but people don't think about altering the amount that they're feeding Mm -hmm. or the times they're feeding with the season. So if you become more sedentary in the winter and you're not doing as much with your dog thinking about, Oh, I need to alter that when you were saying calories equals energies, if you're giving the exact same and you say, my dog eats a cup and a half every meal, and that's set through all of the stages of life, that's not going to match. And you're going to either have that hangry dog in the summer who's going, (laughs) holy moly, I need more calories. Or you're going to have the dog in the winter that's putting on the pounds and saying, I don't know what to do with all this energy you're giving me. And the, the other point that I just would make, and it's just common sense, there are breeds, the, the, the retrievers, shepherds for sure, and there are others that have are predisposed to having hip issues mm-hmm. as they get into, especially as they get older, seven, eight, nine, ten. Having carrying around extra weight just makes that burden even greater, I think, on the dog. So you want to watch that. Yeah, I, it would just seem to me. I'm not a, a veterinarian or anything like that, but it's just I've learned because I've had them and I've gone through the whole thing with these dogs, and it's a lot to watch happen. One so, of the things I find the hardest with that, Mark, is I work with a lot of dogs who struggle with different behaviors, and often pain is that missing mm-hmm. piece of the puzzle that people aren't seeing. Yeah. And until they've seen, say, a specialist who is really looking for signs of pain. Some of our dogs are rather stoic when they start to have those first little issues with you listed joints and knees, but sometimes it's all connected where it could be higher up in the spine and things like that. And if they are carrying excess weight, things that they Mm -hmm. might've done as a younger dog, like vaulting into a car or getting up a flight of stairs, or maybe even tolerating something like veterinary handling or a younger animal or say a toddler in the home that might be affected behaviorally when it might come back to the way the dog is feeling in their body. And so back to that (laughs) phrase, Linda, of maximum growth isn't always optimal. Same with Mm -hmm. weight gain and calories and things like that. And I think some advice you gave me when I was asking you about my senior dog once was as he gets older to think about not more quantity, but higher quality of ingredients. So if I was making changes to really go for things that are more beneficial for him from a nutrient standpoint. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very good point. And I always get blamed as the dog trainer because I always want people using things like positive reinforcement to give their dog feedback. So when we think about using food as feedback, and Linda, I know you probably run into this with your training practices, is how we need to get people thinking about what often is labeled as treats as also food and calories 
And so if, say, you're feeding the same amount of food every night at dinner and then you're going to your dog training class and then you're handing all these little morsels over to your dog, right, then that's also right. calories for the dog. Definitely, yeah. So. Yeah, and, and one of the ways we tend to handle that, and I, I do with my own dogs too, is I we feed our dogs twice a day and their morning meal is usually pretty standard, although I give them their morning meal after I've done their whatever type of walk we do in the morning. And if we did a, a short walk, it's not very nice out, they might get a little bit less and vice versa. If we do a long hike, they might get a little more, but their big, their second meal at night, I personally generally always feed after I've trained. So we tend to feed them pretty late, but then I always can adjust that. If we had a long training session and I you know I gave them a lot of calorically dense treats, we can then ratchet back a little bit. And what I'd add to that, and I imagine you probably do this with your clients as well, Drew, is that if a lot of treats are being given if it's a really highly food motivated dog, you could sometimes get away with using their food, you know, for that. Or if you can't do that and you are using a high level, very attractive food, but if you're using a lot um, to try and use something that at least is balanced, you know, that, that is not a, not an imbalanced treat, you know, in general, a small amount, is not going to hurt one way or the other, but, but the clients should be aware of that for sure. Yeah, I love integrating hand feeding into training. I have so many clients that are very happy to do that rather than going and spending a fortune on a little bag of treats Mm -hmm. that's got all these filler ingredients where the third ingredient is high fructose corn syrup. And you're going, I don't think we need that. Yep, it's a great (laughs) point. So really simplifying food and, and treats into something that's either single ingredient or part of their normal diet anyway, rather than adding more to it. Yes. And I think it's a good point because treats are an area that has been very neglected in terms of quality. There are just so many basically garbage treats out there. It's like treats for ourselves. Nutritionally, we just haven't gone very far, which is interesting because the the price markup on them are just huge. And so I think mm-hmm. if we could you know, get more that were nutritionally um, high quality, um, then it would be a good thing. Well, I would say to end this segment that I've been happy to see, I guess the word I would use is wellness. I see a movement toward wellness. We see it in humans. We've seen it for the past two or three decades in humans and the correlation between what we put into our bodies, the food that we eat and our health, right? It seems pretty simple. And there, I hear more veterinarians and I'm just seeing more out there with the veterinarians that are making these better foods for us, making more available for us, more on the gently heated, freeze-dried side of things. And they're correlating it, they're tying it to better health outcomes later in life. Better nutrition throughout life means a better life overall. And I am also seeing that, I have to say, in treats. There's more, it's not I'm not going to mention brands. It's more available than there used to be, certainly when we were growing up. Certainly, Um, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, and I'm glad to see it. And again, it's that whole value system that we have for ourselves, and it's becoming a lot more available for our dogs and I guess for our pets in general. So I think it's a good time. When I go to these shows, it's like a food, to me, it seems like a food revolution. Yeah, oh, I definitely agree. Right? A lot of veterinarians are getting in on the gig. I get it. A lot of it's marketing (laughs) and it's oversell and it's overkill. And I don't like when the doctors get too crazy with their sale, with their selling. But on the other hand, if you look at the ingredients, you look at the way it's being cooked and processed and all that, we have a lot more available to us now than we did 10 or 20 years ago. And I think it's all frankly to the dog's benefit. Yeah. So yeah, it's really nice to see that. So I guess we can move on now to our hot topic. (laughs) And I think we can agree on what our hot topic is not going to be, which is bioavailability. <laughs> because you're going to have a show on it. So. Not, because we're going to have a whole show. Right. Why our would we be bioavailability. here? Drew, can you just not take that down, take note of the fact that we have to have an episode on bioavailability? Linda, should you be Got our it. guest on that or should we have somebody else come in on that one? Um, but the hot topic is going to be, and I'm just going to let you talk. Human food versus pet food. Go. I think Drew alluded to it a little bit earlier, and we had a a short chat about it prior to starting this. So that whole division is a relatively recent one from a historical 
perspective, when pet foods, commercial pet foods as we think of them today, were really first developed strongly. They, they were kind of drips and drabs before that, but in the 1950s is when the extrusion process, which is what produces dry food, was developed. And that was a period, if we look at what we were like culturally then, that was a period of greater living through chemistry. It was a period when we, we were all agog also over frozen meals for people and new technology. We were processing our own foods. And that was when fast food first came on the market. So there was this drive towards what we think of now is more highly processed foods, but at that time were promoted as foods of convenience and foods that were not very expensive and were easy to prepare and that you could feed your family and your dog very easily on this convenient food that comes frozen in a, I don't know if you remember the early frozen meals that you would get. TV the dinners. Frozen dinners. Yeah, on the trays and you'd eat right. from the TV. So there was a yeah. period when that type of food was highly attractive. And for dogs, for our pets, that meant highly processed foods that were dry, that you could get at your supermarket, that were easy to feed, and they kept for a long time. But those foods all came, of course, from pet or feed grade, if you will, ingredients that were all byproducts of the human food industry. And they not only were they byproducts, but they also were handled and sanitized and transported differently than human foods are. And that's still true to this day. But what, what was the dilemma for the companies making those foods was we sure as heck don't want people eating these because they're not probably not safe for people to eat. They may not be safe. So, so they came up with this division of complete and balance that was first a marketing claim and eventually had some legs and, and now has good legs in terms of um, of standards, but at the, when it was first brought out, it was just a marketing claim. So they first said that complete and balance. In other words, it's all your dog needs to eat. But the second thing they said was that you only feed this food and nothing else. And this is dog food and this is separate from human food. And then, then the FDA got involved, again, with good reason. And one of the regulations that stands to this day is that pet food must be labeled as pet food, not for human consumption. With Again, with good reason, because all of the early foods and most of the foods today are made with byproduct ingredients that are byproducts that come from the human food industry and are not, they don't meet the same standards that our own foods meet. What that has evolved into is this weird thing about human food is different somehow than animal food qualitatively. And what we've lost in that history is the understanding that was a created division. That wasn't a natural division. There's, as we said earlier, dogs are mammals, just like we are. They have all the same essential nutrient needs, not in the same quantities, but they have the same essential nutrient needs that we do. We are not that far apart genetically. And so it would be silly to think that we would have an entire class of foods that is just special to homo sapiens and it differs qualitatively from foods that other animals can eat. So the idea that a dog should never eat human food is a human construct and a human construct that came out of the pet food industry because they had great benefit from making sure that construct was in place. And then it's just become our collective understanding that we think, oh, dog food's different from human food, dog food, dogs should never get human food. And here we are today. <laughs> That's it in a nutshell. So it's okay it seems for like dogs it. to have human food, obviously. Yeah, right? Human I food mean, Human food dogs. comes from the human farm and dog food comes from the dog <laughs> farm, right? Yes, exactly. I think it also plays to our fears. I hear so many people say this still, like whether we're talking about the dog either gaining weight, they'll say, but I don't even give him any scraps or human food. Yeah. And like you just right. said, they might be more prevalent to gain weight on some of these ultra processed food because yeah. of the dehydration. And I see that a lot in puppy classes when people are using these really, maybe these treats that have a lot of like salts and things in them where the dogs have to stop frequently and go drink water because mm -hmm. they're just, it's like eating a whole bag of chips or something. It is. Like, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I need something example. to drink. Yeah. I see these yeah. puppies all the time who are like, stop feeding me treats for a minute so I can go get a drink. Like I yeah. can't do this. And then they have trouble house training them. They're like, why is he peeing all the time? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what's up for debate? Okay. 
I think that we have a list of things we can look at, but I'm going to go right to grain versus non-grain. This is, in a way, another hot topic, and it is being debated. And yeah. I know that you've done some research on it because I've read your research. Yes. So, and actually, I'm glad that you brought it up because um, I could do a little plug here. There is actually a group that the Science Dog has been collaborating with called BSM Partners, and they are um, like the Science Dog. They are not affiliated with any company or brand. They're a private sector research and consulting firm. And they actually, since the 2018 scare about grain-free and DSM dilated cardio DCM sorry DCM dilated cardiomyopathy in dogs. They have done a lot of research and they just published. In fact, it's literally going up this week. A new webinar for us at the Science Dog that covers all of the research behind grain-free and heart health in dogs. And not to give away the end line of it, but but basically a lot of focus was put upon pulses, which are the seeds of legumes. So um, common pulse ingredients are uh, chickpeas, peas, uh, soybeans, um, beans. And so the research that they have compiled to date um, suggests that those ingredients are not involved. Um, there may be something else involved. They also had some really fascinating research about breed predispositions and the fact that mm -hmm. certain breeds, including mm -hmm. golden retrievers, appear to have appear to be predisposed to low taurine levels in their blood, and that can predispose them to then a diet. It's very complicated, but then they'd be predisposed to a dietary deficiency. In other words, they may need more taurine in their diets. Mm -hmm. And then they also looked at generally across all diets, whether or not there was a strong causative relationship between diet and heart health, and they're just not finding it. That doesn't mean that something else won't be found, but the whole grain-free versus not grain-free is, is mm -hmm. not right now being supported. Um, the other point I would make is that, this is aside from that webinar, which I would highly recommend people take a look at, is that when we say grain-free food, and there are several nutritionists who who spoke to this in much more clearly than I can because they were they had more background in it. But when we speak about grain-free foods in terms of we look at the formulations that are made, are used to make those foods across the many brands that have them, it they're so different in that in terms of what pulse ingredients they use, what grain products they use, what meat meals they use. It's like saying all Italian food causes heart disease. You know, right. it's such a wide range of foods that it's it's literally impossible mm -hmm. to make any type of causative um, conclusion um, if one even exists. It's 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 almost ludicrous to to take such a large class of foods and to make a claim such as that. They also in the webinar, it's it's probably too much to go into here. They also go into the history of why and how um, that claim of grain-free came about from 2018 until now. And this is an area that I hesitate to even bring this up because it's just me going off on a tangent. But um, when I hear peas and chickpeas and legumes and whatever else, other vegetable type things are in there in the grain-free food, then that's when I start to hear things like Roundup and glyphosate being mm -hmm. sprayed on all these things. That's a good point. Yeah. And I just wonder if that's what's causing the problem and if there's more of that in the grain-free foods. It may, not be the, yeah. it may not be the peas. Why would it be the peas? I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to go there because I don't know. But I begin to wonder about this whole Other things. thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. To that end, the grains that those pulses are replacing were, all came from the same agricultural system. So you'd expect if they are being sprayed, everything's being sprayed. But, but yeah. it is a good question to bring up, certainly. And again, back to the earlier chat we had about the non-GMO, the whole idea behind non-GMO is no, they're not being sprayed with the same stuff. You can bring it up at your webinar and ask all the big scientists, hey, <laughs> the smart yeah, and, and, <laughs> love I'll dogs. just direct them your way. <laughs> but but it's it's a good point, and you know we're talking about, and I don't even 
Linda, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't even think it was a study. Wasn't it just like a press release in 2018 that caused that big stir? And it felt like for years after that, I just had clients and people that I was interacting with. They're just like, and don't worry, we're feeding grain free. And oh, my vet said, oh, we got to get off the grains. And it, was you know, we, it just kept yeah. it it just completely caught fire. And, and really what I really appreciate about your work, your books, your website, is it just feels like this port in the storm for me when I'm hearing all this information, we've got all these things being thrown at us as I can say, well, I wonder what Linda says about this. And sure enough, you have a really good blog right there on the science dog that's still up. I yes, checked. it is. Yeah. And, and so it's a great resource. And I feel like you even added to it. Didn't you even do like an afterword or an update? Yeah, because of this webinar. In fact, that's it's linked to the webinar that's, that's coming up because of all the new research, because just really in the last five years, so much has been published about it. And um, but yeah, and you were right when you mentioned um, it was actually an opinion piece that set this whole, you know, yeah. storm um, on Not fire. A study. And not a study. It was an opinion piece. Unfortunately, it, it was published in JAVMA, which is the you know, Journal of the Vet Medical Association. So it was published in a veterinary journal, but it was an opinion piece. That's all that it was. It had right. no data. And it just, you know how things do, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's always some new fad thing that's going to take off. And unfortunately, what, what's really sad, Hello. I think, is that many the, many Hank small arriving, pet food sorry. companies that produced decent foods and good foods um, were very badly hurt by that. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is there a dog in the back? Yeah. <laughs> Hank is always a dog in the back. Oh, oh, hey, yes. <laughs> oh my it's, gosh. It's not, beautiful. Yeah. It's not love he dog if a dog doesn't show up. To <laughs> yes. The, so. He or she. He. His name is he. Hank. Hank. He is gorgeous. Yeah. I love yellow labs. I adopted him just three months ago. Oh, he's yeah, beautiful. He's white lab. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the inspiration for this conversation is Mark's journey with Hank of like, how do I work with this dog? How do I help this dog have the best life? And, you know, I think that's really what motivates a lot of these questions and a lot of the work that you do is how do we do better for our dogs? I think something that comes up for me when I teach classes okay. at the university or if I'm teaching a behavior class is, once people learn, sometimes they have a tendency to feel guilt or shame about what maybe they did in the past or what they fed in the past or training techniques they used in the past. And so my whole kind of additive is learn better, do better. And as I get more information, as I get better information, as I can disseminate things like that 2018 hot take uh, that caused all the fuss, then I can make better decisions and also educate people around me and my community and help people so that if people ask Mark, oh, <laughs> how do I feed my dog? He'll say, well, guess what? I've got a great <laughs> new resource for you. It's called oh, Love Linda Dog. Case. And I'm going to text you this podcast. And also, <laughs> when in doubt, go check out The Science Dog because it has great courses and webinars. And, um, you know, I, I find the art of reading books is a hard sell for some people these days. But books are still a great source of information. And it, it's been so helpful to me to be able to turn to your work and your resources to help me kind of pursue that. Because people think if you have a dog, if you work with dogs, you should know all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you. I, pr I appreciate that plug. It was very, very nice. Do's and don'ts. Chocolate. Talk about chocolate. Yeah, so it's not so much that chocolate is toxic to dogs, but rather large amounts of chocolate are toxic to dogs. And basically, it, the Cliff Notes version is that dogs metabolize chocolate in the same way that we do, but much more slowly. So, you know, the whole caffeine buzz, which actually the compound in chocolate is called theobromine, which is a like caffeine. It's a caffeine-like compound, but it has the same effects that caffeine has. So when we think of having a caffeine buzz or having too much caffeine, that's how a dog feels having too much chocolate. And if they get way too much, it actually can be very very serious and can even be fatal in small dogs. But again, it, it takes a lot of chocolate. Um, I think in- So this is actually new information to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, 
I, I've never even given my dog the slightest morsel of chocolate. And you're saying it probably isn't going to kill him. Not even probably. It won't kill him. No, I give my goat chocolate all the time. Right. I don't give them. You do? Oh yeah, do? I don't give them. I don't give them a handful. Like of a whole, a whole Hershey <laughs> yeah, bar. Yeah, give them a, a little. Bar, right. Yeah. Oh really? I, um, got it. We got our hot take. Linda, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I, I volunteer at a soup kitchen every Friday, and and everyone there knows that I'm a dog person, and I always bring something home for the dogs. And for the longest time, they'd be like, "Oh, you can't take that. It's got chocolate in it." And now they understand and like. They get it. It's not going to hurt my dogs. Yeah, little chocolate. And you're like, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> <laughs> but that is a big one. Exactly we see these what lists. I said. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it what you said? <laughs> Have you not been to my website recently? <laughs> but we always else? see those posters <laughs> with the toxic foods. And, and really, it seems like a lot of those and kind of going back to your nutrition courses of like functional ingredients and what things are harder for dogs to really utilize as energy and as, you know, something to help them thrive. It's kind of more about that, like, what's what's really going to serve the dog versus, you know, what you were talking, the difference between nutrition and toxicology when it comes to some of these ingredients, right? Yeah, it's a great point. It's that, you know, um, the, the compound in chocolate that affects dogs is the same compound that affects us, you know. Um, you know, we'd pre- pre- feel pretty sick if we ate a bowl full of, of semi-sweet chocolate. The point to make also about chocolate, because I, again, I don't want to tell people to go out and start feeding their dogs chocolate, is that when you have serious <laughs> cases, it's usually when a dog has broken into chocolate, you know, has, you know, people left mm-hmm. a, a bag of semi-sweet pieces yeah. on the, you know. The Halloween candy Yeah, story. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that happens because dogs scavenge, you know, so, yeah. um, and, you know, so that that's, is important to say that. And Drew, so Linda Case is saying feed feed your dog chocolate, and it's, it's only our second episode, and we're you, gonna you, you and I got very different takeaways from this I hope show. You guys today. have good insurance. Yeah. Any other? Insurance. Right. How, how about some do's, Linda? Are there any are there any ingredients that would surprise people or treats that you're seeing in your in your training schools that are some people that are really diving into nutrition or showing up with that you think might have you know, some real benefits to dogs? I think right now what, what I've, and this just is because where's my writing's been recently and where there's some good research um, has to do with the balance of omega-3 fatty acids and, and omega-6 fatty acids in that um, for overall health and for reducing um basically overall inflammatory responses. There may be some benefit in reducing omega-6s and increasing omega-3s. Um, and so um, that's probably where I would say a good focus is, is feeding a food that has a, a higher ratio of omega-3s or higher proportion of omega-3s in it. Um, so for example, you know, something with fish oil in it. Um, and, and that is, again, because there's evidence that shows it does kind of basically tamp down um, the body's inflammatory responses. And um, I know we were going to touch on it. It's not my area of expertise, but uh, the whole microbiome thing is that, you know, feeding for a healthy gut. Um, We're not quite there yet in the research, you know, in terms of feed this and your dog's gut will be healthy. But we do know that different forms of diets affect the gut microbiome in different ways. And there certainly, I think in the next few years, we'll probably know more about healthy ways versus non-healthy ways. Hmm. Well, kind of going back to what you said about feeding some diversity, it's really hard. And we know this through humans to have really good health in our guts. If we're feeding really bland over-processed foods and we're not getting a variety of foods in there. So, you know, it, (laughs) it remains to be seen when we get some evidence, but I think it'll be one of those well duh moments for us when we go. Yes, huh. I agree. That it seems intuitive. We, we know this. Yeah, now science totally is proving agree. what we yeah. maybe intuitively knew. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. So I have a list here of ten good foods to feed your dog. I'm, I'm not sure it's even ten, but on the list are apples. You you approve apples? Strawberries. Um, apples are fine. Yeah. Strawberries. Strawberries, blueberries, bananas, pears. Broccoli, yeah. carrots. No. Well, broccoli and carrots, I would probably cook first. Um, I eat. steam mine, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, just like people. Yeah. yeah. How about Can eggs, we- Linda? I know a lot of people love to add eggs. Do and people talk about dogs and their abilities to digest different things. What What are your recommendations around cooking eggs and level of cooking eggs if they wanted to add an egg? 
Yeah, eggs are probably one of the highest quality protein sources we could feed. They must be cooked. And uh, that's not just because of foodborne illnesses, but it has to do with um, the egg white contains avidin, which is a basically inhibits biotin absorption. So you can cause a, actually cause a biotin deficiency in, in dogs, although that's very, very rare. But the other thing that eggs have, egg whites have, that is doesn't get as much press, but is probably more important nutritionally, they have what's called a trypsin inhibitor. And basically that inhibits the dog's ability to digest protein. And it actually and unfortunately there's research to show this, it actually will, if you feed a bunch of egg whites to a dog that aren't cooked, it actually will inhibit their ability to to digest the protein that's in the diet, not just that's in the egg. So that can be wow. pretty dangerous. So if someone oh. feeds a lot of raw eggs, they may actually oh. see an impact on digestibility. That's so as long as they're cooked, they're fine. I feed co- cooked eggs all the time. Yeah. He gets a soft boiled egg, Hank, every morning. With his that's good. Egg. Great. Yeah. 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 Seven minutes. This perfect soft boiled <laughs> That the seven he doesn't like it poached. Egg. <laughs> no. Or on occasion, he you know, hard-boiled, but soft-boiled in general. Yeah. yeah. He takes his decaf espresso on the veranda, <laughs> yeah. I Right. Any other don'ts? Like, do not ever feed your dog. We, we talked about it, Lori. The, the whole grape and raisin thing, um, the latest research does, does pinpoint a cause. Um you know, um, so so I, I generally probably wouldn't feed grapes just to be safe. But again, I, I think that... Um, One grape isn't pro- going to kill your dog. Yeah, yeah. But again, yeah. Um, yeah. But I, and, it, it, that actually, again, falls more into toxicology. And so I would, uh-huh. I would, um, I would, I would... The last food I would ask about would be cheese. About cheese, whether or not to feed it? Yes, um, small amounts are fine it, with all dairy products for dogs. Like most adult animals, dogs are lactose intolerant. So if you feed they a are. lot, yeah, oh. most dogs are, you know, oh. just uh, like some humans are. Um, yeah. So if you feed a lot, they, you'll uh-huh. probably see some you know, loose stools because they won't be able to digest the lactose. Many cheeses, the lactose is low anyway, you know, if it's been fermented out. Um, so, so it's probably a non-issue, um, mm-hmm. but um, probably just on the safe side. I wouldn't feed too much. Again, a little bit's fine. Moderation. Moderation. Not a concept we do well in this country. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I definitely think that it follows along the lines of your new book of feeding smart, because as I learn more, I always feel like I'm more capable of doing just that and feeding smart. And something I love in this book is it's very practical. So if I were worried about canine obesity and I was listening to this podcast, I might flip to section six where it says, is my dog too fat? So it's a very straightforward approach and then you will always validate. And if some people don't understand when we say evidence-based approach at the end of every chapter, there will be citations. So the nice thing is you don't have to become an expert. You don't have to go out and learn how to read journals and search through all these and say, well, this was a a great case study or, oh, this was a limited participant and see, you know, where all that quality comes from. So Linda really does the legwork in these books and these courses. So I can't recommend it enough. Linda, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. And I definitely know that I will be feeding smarter because of you. (laughs) And we so greatly appreciate your time, your energy and your wisdom. Thank you for inviting me, Drew and Mark. And it was nice to meet Hank as well. Yeah, this has really been an extremely helpful, inspirational, informative chat. That's great. I I really enjoyed it. I I learned a lot. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I I really really enjoyed it. And and best wishes on your bioavailability tour. Yeah. Sorry, what? (laughs) Bioavailability tour. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The bioavailability tour. Oh my God. We have a new brand. (laughs) Exactly. All right. I'll I'll put it in the maybe pile. All right. Thank Thank you you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Drew here. I just want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Fig and Tyler. Remember, they've got this awesome program for pet professionals. All you need to do is go to the Pet Pros tab on figandtyler.com and hit join program. 
use promo code LOVEDUG in the referral tab. Pet parents out there also get 10% off your first order. Go to figintyler.com and then at your checkout cart, just put Love Dog in the promo code and you'll get that special discount just for being a listener to the show. Okay, so that's our show for today. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed it and found it helpful. And if you did, can you do us a favor? Can you please tell everyone that you know that has a dog that also might enjoy it and find it helpful? And can you please also hit the subscribe button? That might be the most helpful thing you can do because the more subscribers we have, the more the algorithms pick us up, the easier it will be for us to keep booking great guests on the show. And it will just in general help us scale the show. So please hit subscribe. Another thing that you can do, which would be helpful, would be to follow us on Instagram. Our handle is at lovedognews. And if you want to contact us directly, we've made that possible by setting up an email specifically for the podcast. You guessed it. It's podcast at lovedog.com. That's really it for today. Thank you for joining us. And I think if I had to leave you with anything today, it would be just simply this. Let your dog be a dog. <laughs>